Every year when the Beecher Lectures are presented, I take off my bookshelves a copy of the original Beecher Lectures, which were first published in 1872, and I have it right here. It sold for 25 cents at a church book sale. <laughs> I read every year a substantial portion of the Beecher Lectures, the original ones, because I want to be in touch with the historic witness of this series. Yesterday, when I did this, I happened to see on the cover side of the title page, you won't be able to see it too well, but I, I had just never seen this before, something that I had not noticed. It reads, letter, Theological Department, Yale College, February 23rd, 1872. It is addressed in capital letters to Reverend Henry Ward Beecher. The letter begins, Dear Sir, allow us to express our high estimation of the lectures on preaching given by you in the Marquand Chapel to the students of this department. <coughs> The spirit of those historic voices echoes in my heart as I write in capital letters, Reverend Brian Blunt, Dear Sir, allow us to express our high estimation of the lectures on preaching given by you in the Marquand Chapel to us who are gathered here for the full convocation of Yale Divinity School in 2011. The letter to Henry Ward Beecher continues, quote, we value your lectures for the views which they give of eloquence in general and of that eloquence in particular which seeks to save men and women by the exposition and application of the gospel. Reverend Brian Blunt, dear sir, there is no need to rewrite that last sentence because you have been as eloquent as Reverend Breacher. <laughs> The letter to Henry Ward Beecher continues. We value your le lectures for their stimulating and inspiring effect on the hearers and for the high ideal which they hold up before ministers and students for the ministry. Reverend Brian Blunt, dear sir, we like our historic ancestors value your lectures for their stimulating and inspiring effect on the hearers and for the high ideal which they hold up before ministers and others who are in all kinds of ministry. We celebrate especially your courage to confront the pathologies of faith and preaching that have incubated in death and sin, and your audacity to claim the possibilities for faith and preaching that have been opened by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The letter to Henry Ward Beecher continues, we cannot but hope that in some form of publication, your lectures will have a wider usefulness, not only among students preparing for the ministry, but among preachers of the gospel in all the churches. Reverend Brian Blunt. <laughs> Dear sir, we cannot but hope that in some form of publication, your lectures will have a wider usefulness, not only among students preparing for the ministry, but in a world where religion, including much of what passes for Christianity, colludes with the powers of death. The letter to Henry Ward Beecher concludes, the Lyman Beecher Lectureship, which was founded by your parishioner, Mr. Sage, and of which you are so fitly the incumbent, promises to exceed in usefulness our highest expectations. Yours truly, and these are the names and titles as they appear, Leonard Bacon, Lecture on Church Polity, etc. <laughs> See, actual. Samuel Harris, Professor of Systematic Theology, George E. Day, Professor of Hebrew and Biblical Theology, James M. Hoppen, Professor of Homiletics and the Pastoral Charge, George P. Fisher, Professor of Ecclesiastical History, Timothy Dwight, Professor of Sacred Literature. Reverend Brian Blunt, dear sir, the Lyman Beecher Lectureship, which you have so fitly filled, promises, promises to exceed in usefulness our highest expectations. For you are helping us to see that resurrection is far more than our Easter morning tributes to the vitalities of the spring equinox. 
Your lectures are awaking in us an awareness that resurrection is the blow that releases the grip of death, that resurrection is the intrusion of grace, the persistence of love, the return of our visionary powers, and the restoration of our humanity when we have all been zombies. For this, our hearts are profoundly grateful. And our minds are intensely focused to hear now your third and final lecture, Invasion of the Dead, Preaching Mark. Yours truly, the attendees of the Yale Divinity School Convocation 2011. Thank you so much. That is, uh, I, I just can't say between uh, uh, yesterday and today, I, I almost feel like I don't have the power to lecture, having heard such <laughs> wonderful things. Thank you uh, very much. It has been my honor to be with you these past two days to share with you some of the thoughts that I'm trying to work through as I think about resurrection and think about apocalyptic eschatology. And today I want to conclude by working through, as Tom just mentioned, the Gospel of Mark. I have long, as Nora said yesterday, believed that um, in Mark uh, we have the presentation of Jesus confronting powers and then what that means for us as we follow through. So what I'd like to do today is to conclude by looking at Jesus' engagement with the powers and then what that means for us. I found myself staring into this cloud of black smoke where the horde had been. The freeway, the houses, everything was covered by this midnight cloud. I vaguely remember other guys getting out of their holes, hatches opening on tanks and Bradley fighting vehicles, everyone just staring into the darkness. There was a quiet, a stillness that in my mind lasted for hours. And then they came, right out of the smoke like a little kid's nightmare. Some were steaming, some were even still burning, some were walking, some crawling, some just dragging themselves along on their torn bellies. Maybe one in 20 was still able to move, which left, my word, a couple thousand. And behind them, mixing with their ranks and pushing steadily toward us, the remaining million that the airstrike hadn't even touched. And that was when the line collapsed. I don't remember it all at once. I see these flashes, people running, grunts, reporters. I remember a newsman with a big Yosemite Sam mustache trying to pull a Beretta from his vest before three burning figures pulled him down. I remember a dude forcing open the door of a news van, jumping in, throwing out a pretty blonde reporter and trying to drive away before a tank crushed them both. Two news choppers crashed together, showering us with their own steel rain. One military helicopter driver, brave, beautiful, desperate, tried to turn his rotor into the oncoming figures. The blade diced a path right down their mast before catching on a car and hurling him into the A&P. Shooting, crazy, random shooting. I took a round in the sternum in my armor center plate. I felt like I'd run into a wall even though I'd been standing still. It knocked me on my butt. I couldn't breathe and just then some dumb fool lobbed a flashbang right in front of me. The world was white. My ears were ringing, I froze, hands were clawing me, grabbing my arms, I kicked and punched, I shouted but couldn't hear my own voice, more hands, stronger, were trying to haul me somewhere, kicking, squirming, cursing, crying, suddenly a fist clocked me in the jaw, it didn't knock me out but I was suddenly relaxed. These were my buddies, they dragged me into the closest Bradley, my vision cleared just long enough to see the line of light vanish with the closing hatch. I know professional historians like to talk about how the battle at Yonkers represented a catastrophic failure of the modern military apparatus. I would prove the old adage that armies perfect the art of fighting the last war just in time for the next one. Personally, I think that's a big old sack of it. Sure, we were unprepared, our tools, our training, everything I just talked about, one class A gold standard catastrophe, but the weapon that really failed wasn't something that rolled off an assembly line. It's as old as, I don't know, I guess as old as war. It's fear, dude, just fear. 
And you don't have to be sun freaking zoo to know that real fighting isn't about killing or even hurting the other guy. It's about scaring him enough to call it a day. Break their spirit. That's what every successful army goes for, from tribal face paint to the blitzkrieg to, what do we call the first round of Gulf War II? Shock and awe? Perfect name, shock and awe. But what if the enemy can't be shocked and awed? Not just won't, but biologically, theologically can't. That's what happened that day outside New York City. That's the failure that almost lost us the whole war. The fact that we could not shock and awe the living dead boomerang right back in our faces and actually allowed the living dead to shock and awe us. They're not afraid. No matter what we do, no matter how many we kill, they will never, ever be afraid. Mark begins here. In a world, metaphorically speaking, just like this, demonic, my name is Legion, for we are many. Catastrophic, in those days there will be suffering such as has not been from the beginning of creation. Possessed, my son, he has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. Murderous, this is the heir, come let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Self-destructive, brother will betray brother to death and a father is child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. Terrified, so they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Apocalyptic, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, there will be earthquakes in various places, there will be famines, hopeless. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark's narrative is more subtle than the science fiction account of Mark Brooks, Max Brooks's novel, World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war. And yet it must have been in its own way on its first reading just as striking, just as disorienting, just as invasive. Mark II images a world dedicated to its deadness, determined to order itself in self-destructive ways that in more lucid moments of self-reflection seem almost pathologically demonic. Even social religious gifts like codes of holiness and purity and Sabbath have in this aberrant age become warped instruments that hatch rather than heal human brokenness. God responded by invading. Well before the resurrection of the Christ into the heavens, God's insurgency had begun on the ground with this man whose first recorded words were, the time is now, the reign of God is at hand. The Gospel of Mark is a narrative record of the inauguration of this invasive reign. An image from the gospel in art by the peasants in Solentiname evokes the sensibility of this reign. It is a remythologization of a Jesus parable by Nicaraguan peasants living under dictatorship in the 1970s. The protagonist in the painting is a peasant sowing seeds. He is walking in a garden, his right arm frozen in full fling, kernels rocketing from his hand. There are two things I notice immediately about the world envisioned by the artist. First, the sower is not in an empty virgin field that awaits first planting. There is already vegetation where he is sowing the seeds. The second thing I notice is that the vegetation and the world that it encompasses are neatly ordered. Everything has been planted with precision. It grows in neat, patterned, almost geometrically designed rows. It is just now that I notice a third thing. The sower is unnecessary. He is not needed in this world because in this world it already has everything it needs. It needs no seeds, it needs no order. And then it hits me, the sore is trespassing. He is not only invading a profitably occupied territory, his seeds are striking disruptively against the garden's carefully manicured patterns. By the very nature of where and how they are targeted indiscriminately, the seeds will raise up a generation of revolutionary and intrusive vegetation. A new garden germinating seditiously under the quiet cover of earth and then with the suddenness of a spring day popping forth in the middle of a frozen February, blooming, booming, exploding into a cloud of fierce, fractious color. <laughs> 
The image is more striking if one imagines a garden of the dead, a beautifully tended contemporary cemetery, a magnificent place of repose like Arlington National with rows and rows of geometrically patterned headstones. And to this ordered, successful domicile of death comes a man sowing the outrageous intrusion of life. Imagine such a world once these seeds of life burrow down into the ground, root their way into the dead, and germinate. Only in the religious imagination can one comprehend what is likely now to spring forth. Here is where the Gospel of Mark symbolically begins. In a majestic, priestly program, scribally structured, imperially instituted garden of the living dead. And then suddenly God invades. This is the apocalypse, the revelation of Mark. Despite all the scholarly huffing and puffing across the centuries as to whether the historical Jesus was or was not an apocalyptic figure, the human one who invades the narrative of Mark's gospel with the thesis declaration about the imminent arrival of God's reign clearly is God's apocalyptic agent. N.T. Wright, quote, Mark has written a Christian apocalypse in which the events of Jesus' life form the vital theater in which Israel's history reaches its moment of apocalyptic crisis, unquote. The crisis point is the same cosmological moment of engagement so graphically conceived in Christ's resurrection by Paul and John of Patmos. There are two ages. The present one is controlled by forces hostile to God's benevolent intent. The future one is envisioned by God where the ability of the powers to possess and thereby enslave humankind has been broken. The turn from the present age to the future age happens in Mark, though, with the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, I want to argue that in Mark's portrayal of Jesus, something even more creatively dramatic has occurred. In Jesus' ministry, the future age erupts into this present age. In Jesus' person and ministry, God opens up a pocket of the future in the midst of the present. And Mark, then, the key apocalyptic moment, the signature invasion, need not wait for the resurrection, which Mark downplays in any case by giving it only a scant eight verses and not narrating anything more than the empty tomb even then. God's future hits the ground the moment Jesus engages John the Baptist at the Jordan and the heavens are torn asunder. In his book, Preaching in the New Creation, Stephen Jacobson traces Mark's apocalyptic moment to chapter 13. Comparing Mark's presentation there to what he claims is a standard pattern of presenting God's movement into our world in Jewish apocalyptic, he notices a significant Mark and shift. According to Jacob, Jacobson, the Jewish apocalyptic pattern is very recognizable. A, God speaks or comes forth. B, nature convulses. C, eschatological outcomes are shown. Appealing to Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 27, he argues that Mark adjusts the pattern tellingly. A, the heavens convulse. B, the Son of Man comes. C, the eschatological outcome. Mark's apocalyptic theophany inverts stages B and A into a deadened, convulsed world where the sun is darkened, the moon is not giving its light, the stars are falling from heaven, and the powers are shaken, the human one invades. The question is, does Mark set up, not just in chapter 13, but all of his narrative this way? From my reading, the answer is yes. John the Baptist operates in a lost world where people must seek reconnection with God, i.e. repentance. And to this context, Jesus invades. In the midst of this context, God invades Jesus, 1 verse 10. Mark is provocatively intentional with his vocabulary when he tells us that at Jesus' baptism, the Spirit descends into him, possesses him. At 3.20 through 22, Jesus' opponents rightly recognize that Jesus is possessed by something inhuman. They blaspheme, according to Jesus, because they proclaim the invasive force to be of Satan and not of God. <coughs> Invaded by the Spirit... Jesus then invades the lives of his disciples and tells them that he is going to send them to invade the lives of others like fishers with hooks. Jesus subsequently invades a troubled synagogue with a cleansing, and then in the first controversy cycle that begins at 140 and ends at 36, Jesus invades sacred holiness 
and purity traditions that have become disfigured by abusive human practice. Right from the start, then, Mark establishes the world as a deadened place into which a possessed Jesus strikes. Through and through, it is invasion incarnation. What is the goal of that invasion? Eschatological relationship with God. Intermittent now. Flashes of the future age in the midst of the present. Mark makes the case provocatively at 2.5 when Jesus acts outrageously by forgiving a man's sins. Not through his death, not through his resurrection, but through his mere word, Jesus offers what the temple infrastructure could not. The spiritual eschatological transformation is so complete that it has social and physical consequences for the man. So Ched Myers writes, quote, Jesus summarily releases him from all debt, hence restoring his social wholeness and thus his personhood, which in turn is equated with the restoration of physical wholeness, unquote. Not recognizing that Jesus is God's invasion of the present age, the scribes are upset because only God can remit this kind of debt. But they are really concerned less about God's feelings than their own because they are the ones who are humanly responsible for dispensing the eschatological promise and social religious effects of this divine prerogative, Jesus' declaration undermines their position of social and religious leadership. Who needs to go to a ruling authority to find God's forgiveness for sin if someone like Jesus can proclaim wholeness on the street? Therein lies the true institutional blasphemy. The leaders want people to believe he is attacking God's prerogative when he is really attacking theirs. In Mark's understanding, he is not attacking God's prerogative because he represents, he is God's invasion. In this realm of living death by his word, he secures in a visible fashion the premonition of eschatological life. Mark's primary narrative theme is that Jesus' preaching way then represents the way of God's future reign. In the various manifestations of that preaching, the healings, the exorcisms, the radical teachings, God's power invades and transforms the human present. The reign of God becomes, to borrow a modern military phrase, an apocalyptic pocket of resistance. In a strategic sense, this pocket comes from the future. It remains the actuality and substance of the future, though it is partially realized in the present human circumstance. It is initiated, sustained, and controlled by divine prerogative from its consummate future location. However, in the tactical arena where strategic theory comes alive in practical application, this pocket operates from and depends upon human conduct. Human performance in this regard never becomes the reign of God. Instead, it tactically represents the strategic reality of that reign, particularly as that reign is represented in the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. So Mark, I think, used Jesus' preaching as the tactical rep- revelation of God's future reign. It was preaching that manifested itself right from the start as social, political crossings of oppressive and divisive, cultic, ethnic, and legal boundaries. In other words, Mark encoded the apocalyptic pre-understanding that God invades transformatively in human history into his Jesus story. He did it by presenting Jesus as a justice-seeking boundary breaker who preaches, that is to say, who acts in the name of the coming reign of God. The correct messiahship path to follow, therefore, was not the old one of violent and militaristic revolution against the occupying Roman presence, nor hapless collusion with it. The correct path was cited through the transformative preaching of Jesus who spoke of the hope for a new Israel whose leadership was more concerned about justice than tradition, service than lordship, and whose reign was as open to Gentiles as it was to Jews. Because the reality and direction of the future is represented in the present by Jesus, which images the touching of lepers, the inclusion of women, the honoring of the broken, the healing and feeding on the Sabbath, the forgiving of sins, the inclusion of Gentiles into the people of faith, because all of that is so decidedly different from the reality and direction of the present, Jesus' eruptions of future pockets into the present create instantaneous conflict. The demonic forces that profit from the malformed present howl in defiance. 
and the people responsible for governing the present fight back with every legal and punitive resource at their disposal. It is this conflict in its final form that ultimately leads to Jesus' death on a cross. Don Jewell remarks, quote, the reasons for Jesus' death arise from his conflict with those in charge of human affairs, the religious and political authorities, unquote. In a very real, apocalyptically determined sense, his death becomes inevitable. Already, this early into our study, we glimpse the directive for the contemporary preaching task as it develops from Mark's apocalyptic presentation of Jesus. The goal of contemporary preaching must be the establishment of such beachhead pockets of future life in the midst of the present circumstance of living deadness. We achieve that goal by focusing not on Jesus' death, but on his life. Mark's discourse on life begins with the dead. To this point, I have tried to image this Mark and understanding of our dead predicament thematically. There's also a linguistic case to be made. As for John of Patmos and Paul of Tarsus, I'm going to look at dead one more time as a cosmic relative linguistic symbol even in the Gospel of Mark. It's clear at 614 when the popular conception about death and specific relationship to John the Baptist is described. Some people believe, and the narrative does not challenge that belief, that in Jesus, John the Baptist may have come back from the dead. Apparently, one need not wait for the consummation of God's reign to be raised from what I have previously described as type A death. That death that occurs in this age was not understood, even in Mark, to be a final state. In fact, death was relative enough that someone with Jesus' powerful connection to God possessed the ability to overturn type A death himself. In the Mark 5 story about Jairus' daughter, a 12-year-old dies. So relative is her condition that Jesus can refer to it as sleeping. Despite being mocked by the onlookers, he takes the girl's hand and revives her. Donald Hegner is right to remind us at this point that what is happening here is not a true resurrection. Quote, it is important to note that in all these instances we have to do not with resurrections but with resuscitations. That is, these people were raised to the old life, not to the life of the new eschatological order, and so they had to die again, unquote. Still, with this presentation, Mark makes two key points. First, dead is relative. And second, in this present age where deadness reigns, Jesus' life and ministry offer a glimpse of the future where death is unable to keep its kills. Even more interesting are the texts that image not resuscitation but true resurrection. At 9, verses 9 through 10, Jesus indicates that he himself will rise from the dead Clearly, the disciples do not understand what this means. They apparently have insufficient resurrection context into which they can filter Jesus' promise. Undeterred, Jesus presses this promise of his own resurrection again at 831, 931, and 1034. Ultimately, Jesus himself experiences type A death. At 1544 through 45, he is described to Pilate as a dead corpse. Clearly, though, according to Mark's narrative, he is not dead, dead, type B death, as the mysterious stranger in the empty tomb declares at 16.6 that he has been raised to life. Jesus lectures on life in the chapter 12 argument with the Sadducees who do not believe in resurrection. At 12.24 through 27, Jesus makes clear that after a person dies, he or she can be raised to angelic new life with God a life that is very different from the kind of living we experience in this age. Life, then, by Jesus' pictorial representation here, clearly connects with eschatological relationship with God. Life, then, is something demonstrably different from what we experience as living in this age. Now, nowhere is this point clearer than in the teaching on costly discipleship, especially 835, where Jesus declares that those who want to save their lives will lose them, and those who lose their lives for his sake will save them. Jesus is talking about two eschatological ends. Two types of life are being discussed. To try to save one's life in this age will mean the loss of one's life in the eschatological age. To lose life in the eschatological age is to gain eschatological death. Here Jesus is speaking neither of relative life nor relative death. Life and death in this eschatological sense are final states. In this historical age, then, though we do not have life, neither are we dead. We are something else, something I have been using the metaphor uh, 
of contemporary popular culture to describe the living dead. Mark's point in all of this, Jesus invades this relatively speaking dead in space, this historical age. Why? To create the conditions for obtaining eschatological life. In this way, the Gospel of Mark is a narrative record of God's past invasion of this living dead age. While there is a hint of a general resurrection of the dead and the gathering of the elect, at 1327, Mark's primary focus is on God's Jesus intervention. I want to make the case that what God does is invade and not rescue. In a rescue, the primary objective is the securing of the prisoner hostage and the subsequent retreat to the closest hell safe zone. Rules of engagement require only the amount of interaction with the enemy as necessary to accomplish the exit. Invasion has a different strategic objective, to meet and engage all opposing forces with the aim of creating a safe zone of an entire occupied region. The goal is not to snatch and leave, the goal is to crush, conquer, and claim. Though military strategists have long recognized the usefulness of overwhelming force, God's Jesus invasion does not utilize that tactic. In their book, Shock and Awe, Harlan Ullman and James Wade make the case that, quote, since before Sun Tzu and the earliest chroniclers of war recorded their observations, strategists and generalists have been tantalized and confounded by the elusive goal of destroying the adversary's will to resist before, during, and after battle. Strategists have a term for this goal, rapid dominance. They write, quote, the aim of rapid dominance is to affect the will, perception, and understanding of the adversary to fight or respond to our strategic policy ends through imposing a regime of shock and awe. Clearly, the traditional military aim of destroying, defeating, or neutralizing the adversary's military capability is a fundamental and necessary component of rapid dominance. Our intent, however, is to field a range of capabilities to induce sufficient shock and awe as to render the adversary impotent. In the invasive maneuver that is the life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth, God opts against rapid dominance and employs instead the surgical special force strike of a single combatant. And so Mark presents his readers with a Jesus who, fresh off of his commissioning at the Jordan, immediately engages demonic, institutional, and human forces who represent the deadness of this present age. In fact, this age is so deadened that Jesus likens it to a house imprisoned by the personification of evil. It's at this point that Jesus likens himself to a single combatant who has come in the night to capture Satan and plunder his evil age as an invasive strike force of one. In such an invasive maneuver, there will be losses, some of them catastrophic. Jesus, God's agent, is threatened early and often. In combat against forces that hold title to an entire age, loss is inevitable. To be sure, as we learn from the critical discipleship section of 827 through 33, where Peter identifies Jesus as the Christ, and Jesus immediately qualifies his messiahship with the title human one, Jesus' Christological identity is, yes, tied up with suffering. Not just happenstance suffering, but suffering born of necessity and apocalyptic inevitability. It is inevitable that Jesus will suffer because he is ushering in God's reign. The cosmic forces arrayed against God and the institutional and human figures they possess can be expected to put up a fight. Therefore, if Jesus is to succeed in his task, if he is to carry through with his mission on behalf of God's kingdom, he will necessarily encounter satanic, cosmic, and human resistance. He will therefore necessarily suffer. D.E. Nanum writes, quote, but meanwhile, so long as this world lasted, anyone in it who represented God's realm and its values must look for misunderstanding and persecution from the evil powers and the human beings in their sway, unquote. No wonder Jesus struck back so angrily at Peter when his lead disciple rebuked him for suggesting such a necessity. To pull Jesus away from such a path would necessarily pull Jesus away from executing God's invasive design. Chad Myers also wants us to recognize that given the social circumstances, Jesus' apocalyptically inevitable suffering is politically necessary. 
The reign of God which Jesus promotes will have as dramatic an impact on the political structures of Palestine and Rome as they will have on the cosmic demonic forces. Therefore, the representatives of those political structures will fight back just as bitterly. This is so Maya's rights because as the advocate of true justice, the human one, as critic of the debt code and the Sabbath, necessarily comes into conflict with the elders and chief priests and scribes. In other words, this is not the discourse of fate or fatalism, but of political inevitability, unquote. Jesus' death is an inve inevitable consequence of the degree of this age's political deadness. Jesus' invasive ministry is both God's act and this age's problem. From 140 to 36 on, Jesus' preaching is viewed as disruptive, even seditious. As early as 2.7 and 3.6, Jesus must know that if he continues, there will be difficulty, and yet he continues. His decision to keep preaching, knowing the inevitable response, makes his death all but inevitable too. It is interesting that in his first statement about that death, he describes it in terms of a political necessity. He will meet the end that seditious political prisoners usually meet in Rome. He will end up on a Roman cross. How he expects his preaching activities to end on the cross should tell us something about the nature of those preaching activities. The question this ultimately raises, of course, is what does all this mean for discipleship and for those of us who preach and encourage discipleship? It means that disciples are called to preach in the present as invasive emissaries of God's future reign. This means preaching the mark and cross and the suffering associated with it as integrally associated with Jesus' invasive preaching ministry, never as an event that stands on its own. Just so Raquel St. Clair writes, Jesus' cross, viewed in isolation from factors that caused it, degenerates into a symbol for all suffering, unquote. Disciples are not called to suffer or to counsel through their preaching the suffering of others, not even redemptive sacrificial suffering. Even so, disciples must be taught to realize that invasive preaching by its very nature is so threatening to the social and political structures, or it should be, that if they keep it up, they, like Jesus, will inevitably suffer. Just so, discipleship suffering should never be the goal. An illustrative example from African-American history is instructive. Martin Luther King Jr. can know on the night before he dies in Memphis that he may well die. He knows this is not because his preaching ministry has been dedicated to martyrdom, but because given the social and political circumstances of this age in which he lived and given the nature of the message he defiantly preached, violence directed toward him was inevitable. To rightly follow King, one would not seek a death like his, one would seek instead to preach like him an invasive message of future light in a dark present age. In this apocalyptic invasive scenario, Jesus' crucifixion is part of the fight, the result of the invasion, not the invasion itself. The cross is one other component from Mark, an inevitable component of the invasive ministry and should be interpreted in light of the ministry and not the other way around. The cross does not stand by itself. In the Pauline corpus, I argue that the cross must be approached through the contextual lens of the resurrection. Here in Mark, I would maintain that the cross must be approached through the contextual lens of Jesus' Galilean ministry. In Mark, Jesus does not go to the cross because of, of a forensic necessity to die so as to pay for all of human sin. At 1424, his blood of the covenant is poured out for the many, but not for the forgiveness of sins, something Jesus has declared himself capable of doing through his ministry and word in chapter 2. The sole strategic objective of Jesus' engagement is God's invasion of this living dead era and God's confrontation of the satanic powers that hold sway in this era. The primary focus of the Mark and apocalyptic preacher must therefore be a recalling of God's invasion through Jesus and a calling for an invasion-like discipleship ministry that engages the powers and rulers of our age. As preachers, we focus apocalyptic not on the suffering and dying, but on the living, and more specifically what it means to live invasively in this historical age. 
So why then does Jesus command his disciples to take up their crosses and follow? This taking of the cross is a cipher for invasion and consequence. Nothing in the marker narrative would support a reading of taking up the cross as taking on suffering generally, redemptively, sacrificially, or otherwise. Take up my cross is thus more likely narratively equivalent to take up my invasive cause. Or as St. Clair puts it, quote, the cross represents the pain that comes as a result of life-affirming behavior modeled after the ministry of Jesus, unquote. The focus in apocalyptic preaching, then, must always be on the life-affirming, invasive behavior, never on the cross by itself. The cross is a historical and narrative connecting pin that holds the two key points of the story together. The ministry that makes the cross inevitable and the empty tomb that makes the cross, from the perspective of invasive combat, ultimately irrelevant. All of which brings us back to where we began these lectures, a focus on res resurrection, even in and perhaps especially in Mark. There are two primary reasons why the powers that rule this age are defeated with God's invasion through Jesus' life and ministry. The first is a negative. The best opportunity for the powers to defeat, Jesus, to defeat God's invasive Jesus strategy was a successful crucifixion that would make Jesus dead. Not dead in a relative transient way, but dead dead, the kind of dead from which there is no return. Who could possibly predict the consequence of a situation where the existence of the moral center of, a, of an entire cosmic age is eschatologically ended precisely because he socially and politically embodied the morality of God's future age? There would, however, be high expectations for a logical outcome, eschatologically destroy the center and one would expect the, aid, the edges, the followers, to fold. But Jesus was not eschatologically destroyed. He was killed on a cross. In this age where dead is relative, where narratively speaking, it is possible for John the Baptist to rebound from a beheading, even a cross killing is at best a spurious victory. The cross can only impose type A death, but according to the apocalyptic scenario that Mark appears to be working with, type A death is transient, giving way to either type B death or life. The cross, however, is connected to neither of those static eschatological realities. To obtain victory through the cross, the powers of this age would have needed to connect the cross to type B death. There seems, however, no mechanism within Mark's gospel or without it to so position Jesus. If then being type A dead is only relative and type A dead is the only kind of dead connected with the cross, then what real victory could there be in the cross for Jesus' apocalyptic satanic opponents, human, cosmic, or otherwise? In this apocalyptic storyline, the cross may be inevitable, but it is hardly conclusive. In fact, theoretically speaking, God's invasion could occur, and in fact does occur, in Mark without a cross moment. To be sure, type A death is necessary. It is an obligatory prerequisite for resurrection. To be raised, you've got to die. But is that death on a cross the prerequisite? Consider the narrative presentation. God's invasion ignites in that striking moment when Jesus tears into the narrative and engages John the Baptist at the Jordan. God's invasion flares divine intent for the future when Jesus turns up missing from that tomb. If theoretically speaking, Jesus had died from old age or a broken heart, the invasive realities of the incarnation and the empty tomb would remain real and viable. The cross showcases more about us than it does about God. It confirms the deadness that rides within us and fights desperately against the promise of future life that Jesus reveals in his present behavior. Given who humans are, the living dead, and who Jesus is, the representation of future life in the midst of the present age, consumed by the influence and power of death, yes, the cross becomes an apocalyptic inevitability because of us, not because of God, because of what we are, not because of who God is. Who God is is exposed the moment Jesus is revealed as God's son and God's mission is revealed as Jesus' ministry. 
Who God is is clarified the moment the man in the empty tomb alleges that Jesus has promised to rise from the dead and restart his ministry through his disciples has been fulfilled. God is the one who breaks in on the powers of death who rule this age and Jesus is coming. God is the one who offers a preview of future life to the living dead who populate this age in Jesus' ministry. God is the one who raises up a working demonstration of that future life in Jesus' empty tomb. In a desperate, futile attempt to counter all of these revelations of life, the living dead offer up a cross. The resurrection is conclusive. In Mark's odd presentation, even this positive can only be negatively portrayed by an empty, negatively occupied tomb. Contemporary preaching often misses the purpose of the empty tomb because contemporary preaching is hung up on the cross. Perhaps not as hung up on it as Jesus, one might say, was it not Albert Schweitzer who famously said that the victory, the reign of that great man was that he hangs upon the cross still? We, I would argue, are more hung up on it than Jesus ever was. While our vision tends to stop there, Mark looked beyond to the emptiness and to the implications of that emptiness for discipleship. The empty tomb especially considering Jesus' passion promises and his final promise to meet his disciples in Galilee following his raising up from the dead, not to mention the mysterious man's declaration that Jesus has indeed been raised and awaits his followers in Galilee, is Mark's narrative metaphor for resurrection. Jesus' resurrection, though, is not, I'm arguing, the invasive turning point of the ages and thus not the narrative focus, not even now. The negatively occupied tomb is the focus, and the empty tomb is less about Jesus' eschatological revivification than it is about Jesus' waiting in Galilee for his disciples, who, if they are to live into their narrative expectations, must undergo a figurative resurrection of their identities as disciples because as disciples they died. In Mark it is the living dead, the disciples in this non-transformed age who are commissioned to rise up from their fear, rise up from their running away and follow Jesus to Galilee, meet him there as the risen Lord and re-engage his invasive preaching ministry as their own. The narrative surprise in a story where the resurrection is routinely expected, confidently predicted, and only briefly and for all intents and purposes rather matter-of-factly realized is not that Jesus gets up, but given all that has happened, that his disciples, either those in the narrative or those outside the narrative reading it, rise to the occasion. More than the blind leading the blind, it would be the living dead invading the living dead. Broken as they, as we are, as captivated by the darkness of this age as they, as we are, they, we, are summoned to be the agents of God's future breaking into the present. I wonder if this is what Jones and Sumney mean when they conclude that, quote, the apocalyptic preacher insists that we must measure ourselves by something ultimate. In this mark and case, the living dead are forced to measure themselves, to measure ourselves by an empty tomb. The way the story ends is 16.8, Men scattered, women, si- women silent, the disciples in the story measure down. Preaching. Preaching Mark apocalyptically, that is to say invasively, begins with this measurement by the ultimate, the future, symbolized at the end of Mark by the empty tomb, narrated throughout Mark by the invasive Jesus ministry. As Jesus demonstrated in his ministry and in his empty tomb the reality of God's future in the midst of the present, so we are called to measure up to the focus and trajectory of the empty tomb. That is, to follow the resurrected Jesus to Galilee and re-engage his invasive ministry to preach expectations and realizations of future eschatological life in the midst of a deadened present where he started that preaching. We do so knowing that because Jesus has transitioned from type A death to eschatological life, he has made the ultimate boundary trespass. He no longer opens pockets of the future. He has crossed over into the future. 
Not a resuscitation, but a resurrection has occurred here. And perhaps this is why the story ends the way it does, with Jesus' negative presence. He is not here at the empty tomb. As a physical presence, neither will he be at Galilee. And yet that is where he will meet them if they follow him and strike their own charge against the boundaries that separate the present from the future and thereby open pockets of God's future age into the devastations of the present age. If Jesus is now indeed of the future, this homiletical breaking of the future into the present is how they and we will transform his negative presence into a positive social, political, ecclesial, spiritual, physical reality. If he is in the future, the only way we can be with him is to open pockets of the future in the here and now. We know, though, from the evidence of Jesus' own boundary-breaking preaching ministry that God's future is shockingly different from the human present. To inaugurate that future by preaching that future will therefore inevitably bring conflict. The sparking of conflict, though, is never the goal of preaching, neither, though, should the anticipation of it cause one to shift direction or content of preaching. Preaching that anticipates God's future, particularly when that future is so different from the agenda of the historical present, is the preaching that faithfully follows the design of Jesus' Galilee program and trusts in the ultimate victory of God's empty tomb. In other words, God's future reign becomes, in pocket moments that resist the oppressive direction of this historical age, concrete in our present preaching. Speaking about the consummation of God's reign, Randall Reed is right to caution that, quote, it is only God who initiates and enacts the revolu revolution, unquote. But in God, with Jesus' invasive life and ministry, that has indeed happened. God has enacted the revolutionary reign. The end game has begun. We need not feel the pressure of inciting it, but we are being pressured and through our preaching must pressure others to engage the powers of this age as part of that oncoming, incoming reign. We are called to apocalyptic action, to the triggering of future pockets of life as represented by the invasive behavior of Jesus' ministry in this historical age of living death. Nathan Kerr is therefore right to argue, quote, Furthermore, if the church itself is to be understood as the gathering of that people whose very existence is to be a sign and parable of the incursion of God's coming reign into this evil age that is passing away, then the missionary vocation must be considered equally constitutive of ecclesia. The church only ever exists, ecclesia only ever is, as the occurrence of a people which, like Jesus himself, is sent into the world, a people whose very life is the gift of participation in this world's liberation and transformation, unquote. Care's aim is to empower an apocalyptic politics of mission. I see Mark's narrative wishing to empower an apocalyptic politics of preaching. The mission of our preaching is to create in a real and vibrant sense the reality and impact of God's breach of this historical age. If our preaching is not just that invasive, it cannot reveal God's future intent in this historical age. Apocalyptic preaching does not just speak of God's reign, it must constitute God's reign. As surely as Jesus' exorcisms, healings, and preachings constituted that reign in the first century. Preaching Mark apocalyptically means developing a clearer emphasis in our preaching on the social and political as well as the spiritual domination of this age by forces hostile to God's benevolent intent. Paul DuPont describes this domination well. Quote, when an entire network of powers becomes integrated around idolatrous values and behaviors, we end up with what can be called a domination system. A domination system is characterized by unjust economic relations, oppressive political relations, biased race relations, as well as patriarchal gender relations, hierarchical power relations, and the use of violence to maintain them all." Unquote. Apocalyptic mark and preaching is dedicated to identifying the evils that exist in modern day domination systems and positing real time alternatives based on an assured understanding of what God's future portends and requires. 
Apocalyptic Mark and preaching creates a politically and socially engaged rhetoric whose end-time orientation has a potent real-time transfiguring effect on these domination systems and the structures that uphold them. Hordes of people and communities day in and day out experience a sense of living deadness because of the way political, economic, and social domination systems crush the human spirit in pursuit of corporate and institutional gain. Apocalyptic preaching sees this crush as the manifestation of Mark's strong man running the house in this historical age. Our calling as apocalyptic preachers is to strike our way into the strong man's house, plunder it, and set its captives free. Our apocalyptic preaching thus focuses as much on human systems as it does on individual human sinfulness. Preaching Mark apocalyptically then means preaching from back to front, starting from the empty tomb and using it as a lens to focus in on Jesus' invasive life. Now I can think of two immediate fear-based reasons why we would find such preaching problematic. First, to preach the invasive ministry of Jesus as a successful combat strike validated by the empty tomb is to invite a view of Mark's gospel that glories in success. Ever since Theodore Whedon's book, Mark, Traditions and Conflicts, scholars have quarreled over whether Mark's son of man portrait was a direct countering response to the divine Superman perception of Jesus that many of his followers had conceived. Could it be that a contemporary focus away from the cross and onto a successful invasive strike followed up by a validating empty tomb would re-energize a glorified view of Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus as an apocalyptic super soldier? Perhaps. Though it would be a misshapen view of Mark's narrative presentation, I do not discount that such an apocalyptic perspective could be crafted and abusively used. However, a counterpoint of sorts is worth noting. A focus on the cross does not guarantee a glory-less or glory-cautious view. Indeed, across the centuries, Christians have gloried in the suffering of the cross and created a spiritual economy where suffering for Christ brings credits and sufficient credits by one a sense of better discipleship than those who do not possess equal suffering credentials. We have gloried in the cross and the sacrificial suffering that goes along with it. More importantly, we have preached the cross as if God also gloried in it. Why is the cross not, as I think Mark portrays it, a place of regret rather than a place of spiritual pride? Why is not anyone forced to pick up and carry a cross forced into a regrettable, not an honorable position? Why do we preach it that way? As I have heard that command of Jesus preached, indeed, I have reflected on my own preaching of that text, and I have heard and continue to hear an unsettling tone. It is as though Jesus, a smile on his face, proud, eager, giving a pep talk before the big game, the mother of all games, in fact, preaches, all right, boys, it's fighting time. Anyone who would follow me onto the battlefield, take up your cross and let's go. Bring it on, world. Bring it. Bring it. I imagine instead a despondent Jesus declaring with conviction, I will die soon because of what I believe, because of how I have lived and how I promise to keep on living. Because in my present life I foreshadow a future whose ethics and rules and ways of living with and treating one another are completely different from the living deadness that consumes this world. What I believe and how I live are in conflict with what the powers of this world believe and how they continue to live and force others to live. If you would follow me in my beliefs, you will conflict with those powers too. You may well die too, but I know no other way to flash God's future back into our present. I am sorry. I am so sorry, but I do not see another way. Regrettably, you too must take up your cross and you must follow. Second, I believe we are frightened of a preaching world not centered on the cross because the cross is like an anchoring stake in the ground of our faith. Jesus' ministry was so long ago, the gospel recordings of it so faithfully and theologically rendered, that we sometimes have a hard time deciding what was historically accurate and what was not. 
The discussions on the historical Jesus are so heated and convoluted that we end up feeling less confident about what we know of him and more despondent of our ability to engage him after reading through the literature than we were before we started. And above it all, Jesus' teaching and behavior are so apocalyptically based as to be a perilous foundation upon which to build in these troubled, technological, scientific, postmodernist, secular, cynical times. Albert Schweitzer has already stated the case well enough, quote, people fear to admit the claims of apocalyptic eschatology would abolish the significance of his words for our time. Yes, we try to tie him to our own time, but as Schweitzer warned, he does not stay. He passes by our time and returns to his own. And with the mark and resurrection, there is nothing except the emptiness of the tomb to hold on to when he passes into his own world, and that's tenuous security. We typically do not trust what we cannot see, so we idolize what we can see. We can see in time, we cannot see beyond time. An apocalyptic vision, the resurrection that is so central to that vision, lies beyond historical place and time and therefore beyond our grasp. Like Linus, the Charles Schultz character in the classic comic strip series Peanuts, we need a security blanket to hold on to in this troubled historical age. And so we stick the pious thumb of one hand reverently in our mouth, while with the other, we clutch desperately to the cross. We are fond of saying that the one thing we can know about Jesus is that he was crucified. That one sure thing that happening in the past is not, at least on the surface, a natural apocalyptic act. It's a historical event. But our faith is not based on history. I'm not sure that our faith can even be based on Jesus being crucified. If it were, it would not matter if he was not resurrected. Paul, though, was right. If he was not resurrected, then our faith is in vain. Which means for Paul, as for Mark, I believe the pivot point for faith is the apocalyptic knife edge of resurrection. To keep from dealing with the resurrection as a literal, invasive combat rupture of this historical age of the living dead, we homiletically pin ourselves to the cross. What if, seen from the apocalyptic perspective, the cross was not the thing? What if it and its violence were seen from the end-time perspective rather than from our-time perspective? God made God's case not because of the cross, but God made God's case in spite of the cross. God did not act with the cross. God acted through the cross. While the living dead determined to stamp out Jesus' message and ministry because of the life transformation it threatened, stabbed the cross into the ground, God turned an invasive maneuver up in the air. Schweitzer was wrong. Jesus was hung on the cross, but he was not hung up on it. He was taken down, and more importantly, he was raised up beyond it. We must do likewise in our preaching. Raise up our vision forward, upward, into the future where the empty tomb awaits us, a future that will surely, if we represent it in our teaching and preaching of Jesus' boundary-breaking, leper-touching, sin-forgiving, prostitute socializing, tax collector cavorting, unjust law breaking, women receiving, all peoples accepting, empire challenging ministry that began in Galilee. We preach that future. We transfigure our present. Apocalyptic preaching is the courage to let go of the past and the present, as important as they are, and ground our world in the future, as Jesus did in his mark and ministry. The presence of the cross draws us back to the past. The reality of the resurrection propels us into the future. It is the same future Jesus represented in his present. It is the future we are called to preach today. Not an idealized future, but an apocalyptic future which invaded the present life and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus and the empty tomb, the proclamation a future life preached to congregations of living dead. Our task is to focus life on them, resurrected life and all that it socially, ecclesiastically, politically, economically, and spiritually means. A very simple example before I close. In the scheme of things, we have much bigger issues before us, but let me illustrate what I'm trying to say with this. Today, still, the worship hour in this country remains the most segregated hour. Is that how the future of worship looks? <laughs>
Does our segregated worship reveal God's future of God's people before the heavenly throne? In the reign of God, will we imagine a men's section over there, a women's section over here, a white people's section over there, black folks' section yonder, and so on? Is that God's apocalyptic future of worship? And if it's not, why does our preaching allow it to be the church's constitutional present? Who, though, in his or her right mind would set about on such a preaching program? This is what it means to preach God's future life in the midst of a dead now. In terms of social justice, economic equality, environmental care, international politics, you name it, the question is, do we see what such an issue looks like from the future? And if we do see such a future, God's future, what are we prepared in the present to preach about it? I used to tell my classes when I came to my last lecture on Mark that I think I know why the women at the tomb are afraid. I think they're afraid of the good news. The good news is that Jesus represents God's future in the midst of the present. The good news is that Jesus has left an empty tomb in the past and is headed for a rendezvous in Galilee where through his disciples this time, he will start breaking the future into the present all over again. It is this good news future that frightens them, that frightens me. Last year this time, I was on a plane traveling to South Korea. I awoke at one point during the flight, a little disoriented, and wondered what time it was. I realized, though, that I was in a transitory state. On a plane for 14 hours meant that I really did not have time because I was moving too fast and therefore was never local. It is location and space that gives me my best sense of time. But on the plane, I was never at a stationary point, so zones and times are always changing. Even if I'd asked the captain what time it was, where the plane was at that moment in space, the information would have been practically meaningless for me. I could not do anything with that time. That time had no hold on me. Time for me was therefore in reference points. At that point of my querying, my best reference point was behind me in the past. So to keep myself oriented, I kept my watch trained to Richmond time. This was the only way for me to put timeness into concrete terms to make it meaningful. I thought of what my daughter and son were doing. My daughter was just getting out of school. It was 5.30 p.m. Richmond, Virginia time, and she had stayed later that afternoon for track practice. My dad, who had come to stay with my daughter, was picking her up maybe from school just a little bit later. My mom would have remained at our home getting dinner ready for my son and daughter, cooking something, no doubt, that both of them liked to take their mind off of the fact that their father and mother were traveling far away. I knew what my school was doing. The students were playing ultimate frisbee on the lawn of our quad. <laughs> the faculty, who had had a 4 p.m. meeting, were likely, I guess, on their way home by 5.31. Never knows. Faculty meetings can go on and on. My office was closed up as my assistant had left around 5. As the dinner hour approached, the library ramped up to receive its evening patrons, but everywhere else, the campus would be quiet. I knew that reference point, both temporally and spatially back there. That reference point gave me comfort, a concrete thing, a concrete place, a concrete, meaningful time that now oriented my life. In fact, it was that past that gave promise to my future landing in an unknown place. That, it seems to me, is one of the reasons why it is easier to preach the cross over the resurrection. We cannot see in place the resurrection. It is of the future. It is a rupture in time, a rupture in the present whose reality is from a time we cannot yet imagine. We have not yet been there, so we, like the disciples in Mark 9, do not understand it. Not really. But apocalyptic eschatology is telling us that what is out there in the future is more real than anything we've left back there behind. It is saying, let go of your past, even your cherished past and people events. Your destiny exists in a future where and when you have never been. While all that you know is in the past, all that you are lies in the future. Your destiny lies in letting go of the past and seeing that future and realizing that future in your present. Now, if you had told me that on that plane, that would have been startling, unsettling, shocking, and threatening. Threatening. 
like the Freedom Riders marching beyond the past through the present on their way to a shockingly different future in 1950 Selma, Alabama, singing the folk song, Keep Your Eyes on the Prize. Refusing to settle back into the evil of separate but equal or to be defeated by the colored only laws of the land, though the Freedom Riders were water holes beaten and arrested, still they sang, got my hand on the freedom plow, wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep your eyes on the prize, hold on. Mark is saying, keep your eyes on the future and hold on. Remember the Bill Clinton mantra in his first political campaign for president? It's the economy, stupid. Well, in this fight, this cosmic conflict, there's a similar saying. It's the future, stupid. That's where the prize is. That's where the resurrection is. And perhaps this is the hope for the church, the future. Not the past where the crucifixion lies, not the present where the church stumbles, but in a prized future different from anything we currently possess. Can we in our preaching visualize, concretize such a future? We need another image. We need a resurrection image. Preaching God's invasion in Jesus' life and ministry and empty tomb is like that. Our calling to replicate the Jesus invasion in our contemporary preaching in pocket moments where God's future flashes into the present is like that. Here, floating in present time, disoriented by the deadness of the world through which we travel, we are commissioned to locate God and then locate ourselves, not via a cherished past landmark, but through a future vision. The content, reality, and impact of that future flashes back to us in the life and ministry of Jesus. The preaching of that ministry comes to life when we dare to journey with the resurrected Jesus who has emptied his tomb of all its past and present sacred furniture and headed back to the future, back to where the future starts, back to Galilee. You know, several months ago, I told a friend about my topics for these Beecher lectures and the risky symbol of the living dead that I intended to use as my point of reference. She said she had a book for me. I was expecting something theological and hermeneutical. What I received in the campus mail was the Zombie Survival Guide by Max Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, over, in over 300 whimsical, tongue-in-cheek pages, Mr. Brooks outlines his theory and the practices that develop from that theory on how to survive a zombie apocalypse, how to make do in a world overrun by the living dead. As I have been interpreting the message of the first gospel, Mark wants us to do something quite opposite and rather counterintuitive. He wants us, as preachers who have followed Jesus back to Galilee, to instigate, foment, and unleash a zombie apocalypse, a world overrun by living dead people who can and who will demonstrate the future life as previewed in Jesus' ministry and anticipated in Jesus' imminent return. Because the powers that rule this age have already done so, we don't have to create the living dead. We only need to refocus and release them, show them their potential, demonstrate their vulnerability to the life virus that is God, and get them to willingly submit to it, open to it, after we have, through our preaching, brought them into contact with it. How to go about it? Between Revelation's dawn of the dead and the imminent future, and Mark's recording of God's insertion of Jesus into the realm of the living dead in the distant past lies the release of the pathogen, Jesus' own resurrection that is the virus of life infecting a world breeding on death. To introduce this virus into the contemporary world is to preach the resurrection through the lens of apocalyptic eschatology. A central part of that proclamation is that those of us who follow Jesus to Galilee determined to reveal through our present existence God's future way of living, represent, we represent, the contemporary strain of that virus. To put it more succinctly, in between Mark's invasion of the dead and Revelation's dawn of the dead is us, the living dead, vulnerable to God, ready to rise. What a joy it would be if our preaching could help provoke that rise. Imagine it, us, the living dead, 
preaching and performing in the present the reality of God's future reign. Now that would be a zombie apocalypse. Thank you. is going to give us a, a, a little period, a uh, time period for questions or responses, and we will hold that session uh, right here in Marquan, uh, because some people may need to go. I think we'll take just a minute, and if the person who has the microphone that I'm supposed to hand, oh, oh, okay, one here and one there, that's great, okay? So if you need to get up and go, we understand, and please feel free to, we'll wait just a minute so we won't be disrupted. Folks, we, we do have microphones available, so if you'll raise your hand, there's uh, a mic uh, over on this side, and then there's a mic over on this side, and it will be brought to you. Please wait until you have the mic, because the sound in here is such that it can be very difficult to hear, even though you think uh, you're being heard. So, Brian, I'll let you uh, take this microphone, and I'll just look for your hand. Anybody? Brian, what would you do with the passage in 1 Peter that I think says, to this you've been called, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his faith? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would read that in the same way that I read, um, take up your cross and follow. That is, that um, indeed um, uh, Christ did suffer, and I'm not discounting that and how important that is. Um, what I'm suggesting is that that suffering comes at a point of inevitability given the kind of ministry he leads, the kind of life he leads. So I think that fits what Peter is talking about as well. Um, now there is, of course, um, 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 an atonement understanding of that, that uh, Peter quotation. I think one can see it uh, through this lens as well as one can see it through the atonement lens. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I'm struck in all three of your lectures by all of the military imagery in which that you've used. I find it very provocative. Um, I also find it very uh, discomforting. Um, can, you, can you talk about that, especially for, for people who, who, are, who, who, who see the good news as, as being uh, news of peace, uh, among others? Yeah, well, I think that's a very good uh, question because I struggled with that as I was working through it. You know, I started with the uh, Revelation lecture, and uh, you know, the whole idea of the um, the uh, combat mythology that uh, Professor Collins, Adela Collins, and others have developed across the years. I mean, I think that's that's an integral part of what um, John is trying to get across. Um, so I think that language is there in the text that we need to work with. I also think it's important that we understand when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, the reign of God, however we interpret Basileia to Theu, 
that he's talking about um, a, um, a metaphor that would be understood in a way of rains clashing against one another. So what I was trying to do is to take the unsettling image that Jesus himself is using and that all the way through the New Testament to then John and Revelation is using this imagery of, um, of conflict and combat between the powers in this world and, and God. Because that's the imagery that was um, comprehensible, I think, um, to, in the way that Jesus wanted it to be to the people um, who were listening to him. So I'm uh, trying to unsettle using the same imagery that Jesus is trying to use to unsettle. Uh, when you talk about kingdoms at war with one another, God's reign and the reign of Satan, how they clash, and then the imagery that takes place uh, as a part of that. I don't necessarily think that, well, I don't think that that means that one can't, um, that one's understanding about Jesus uh, bringing, um, and his message bringing, uh, being one of peace is compromised. Because I think what he's suggesting is that in, on this cosmic level, uh, this, 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 combat that takes place between God is imaged not in a violent way by us, but is imaged in another way by us. So the example I could use is, um, is the book of Revelation, where there is clear combat language between God and Satan. There's war. I mean, it's just clear. There's war between God and Satan. Never, however, does John expect his own hearers and readers to engage violently. They are to witness, and to witness in a way that puts them in peril and not to respond in a violent way when that peril comes upon them because they believe God will do that for them. So on the one hand, you have this imagery of God's conflict and we, us being drawn into it, but on the other hand, um, you don't have the expectation that we then go out and um, imitate or participate in God's movement by acting violently. We participate in God's movement with the same kind of assertiveness, but in um, ways that are nonviolent. So matter of fact, I um, translate... Um, Hupomone in the uh, book of Revelation, which is mostly translated in the NRSV as patient endurance. I translate that as nonviolent resistance because I think that's what John is calling for. I mean, the, the persons who were in the civil rights movement, for example, there was combat going on. They were participating in that combat. They were caught up in the clash, but they don't respond violently. What they're called to is nonviolent resistance. There is an engagement that can take place that can be a part of this war that need not necessarily be a violent engagement. So it, it's, a, it's a complicated answer, but um, um, that's what I'm working with as I try to work through that image. I don't want us, in the same uh, way that I don't want us to lose apocalyptic, I don't want us to lose the shocking nature of this reign of God language. So we kind of take it as, you know, the, you know, the whole idea of, and I like some of the translations, commonwealth of and all those kind of things. I think they lose the um, combat mythology that's inherent within the reign of God imagery as Jesus and these New Testament writers are using it. I, th I don't think we need, I don't think we want to lose that. I think we want to understand how we work with it. Okay, we'll take this one and then uh, you, Robert. Thanks. Okay, good call. Uh, very rich. Sometimes as I'm following along, I, some of my questions sort of get lost. And it seems to me that when you sort of trim things back, there was a question that Bultmann proposed very clearly. Is the resurrection something that happened to Jesus? Right. Or is it something that happened to Jesus' followers? That's right. Now that's a big question. Yes, because for him, it's in the preaching of the it's in the preaching of Jesus that the resurrection takes place amongst his disciples. That's right. So that's the demythologization that I've been talking about. Um, See, I'm pro I find it problematic because is the resurrection also something that God did and happened in His own mind, mm -hmm. in which you could also say that the crucifixion happened in His mind. It is God and God taking the sins of the world upon and into the divine life and depriving of their power to sort of say what happened to those guys there? Mm. Who got ground under? Mm -hmm. What is their role? The ones who've already gone and died for the sake of the kingdom of God. What, what's their destiny? It looks to me like we've moved it so dramatically into the future that that question is obscured and it's a huge question. Oh, it's a very, it's, I, I think it's a tremendously huge question. 
Um, I, and that's a, that's a very good um, uh, question overall. I'm still struggling with a lot of what you're, you're um, asking in, in the question. I mean, I haven't come to a place of resolution, probably won't until, you know, the kingdom comes, right. But um, what, I'm, what I'm stressing here is that, um, uh, first, I, I think Bultmann's demythologization does a disservice to um, how apocalyptic needs to live in our contemporary understanding of what God is doing. And so that's where I move to the resurrection and uh, refocusing and re-seeing the resurrection. What I'm pushing for, as you note, is to see even the cross through the lens of the resurrection. I would make the case that um, as you read through the narratives of the Gospels um, and as you read through Paul's work as well, that the way in which the cross is understood is through the lens of the resurrection. No question. I agree. It, right, okay. Um, so what I'm pushing for then it is, is it is Jesus' resurrection, that's right. It is Jesus' resurrection. Um, looking through that lens, one then understands Jesus' moment on the cross. Um, so, um, I, would, I would agree with you. Oh, okay. I stand with that, but some of the things the gospel sort of articulate that, the mm -hmm. of that, you, they, they don't have a clue in Mark what Jesus does. Good. And it's all the way in the cross. In, in Brooklyn, New York, I am part of a tiny racial minority. Um, I'm wondering how you feel being a part of a tiny racial minority here. Oh, um, how I, well, um, I feel like um, I'm an, in, I feel like being an invasive representation of uh, God's possibility. <laughs> Thank you profoundly for your presentation. Um, in my mid-80s, I may have heard as many Beecher lectures in this place as anyone present, and you have been challenging. I had a question which you may recall I asked you privately, and I was looking forward to the answer, but this is such a great opportunity that maybe you could benefit by sharing your response with all of us. It was my privilege to be invited to Harvard Law School a few weeks ago to celebrate the light and legacy of Charles Hamilton Hughes, Houston, who had done so much as a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Amherst and an early graduate of Harvard Law School when he moved on as Dean of Howard Law School and assembled the minds and brains to strategize for developing a means of dismantling racial segregation in education in this nation. The wonderful gathering began with a person giving a historical view of Harvard's beginnings. And I'd always been rather embarrassed that Brown, where Baptists were prominent, had such a regrettable past, and conflicted because Yale University still has as its great symbols leading races in the names of the colleges. But when I heard the true story of the beginnings of Harvard University, it seemed anemic. And as the presenter dwelt so much on the 16, 1700s, I could not resist asking him if he would share out of the richness of his experience and wisdom, if he would share with us the story of the life and legacy of John Chavis. I have asked many Presbyterians, and they were unable to, the light that lit up in your eyes when I asked that question leaves me anxious. And I, and I wondered if you'd be so kind as to tell us of John Chavez. Oh, well, I don't know. Perhaps you say Chavez. Oh. Many do. 
Well, I don't know enough about him to be able to, to, to give a discourse. I just know the name and know what he stood for. I don't know a great deal more than that. So I, I'm not the one who could be able to give that discourse of him here. I'd, I'd love to do that, but uh, I'm sorry, I, I, can't, um, I can't fill in um, for you. These two hands, I think, were next to Dell and then... Thank you so much for your provocative lectures these last days. Uh, I am not to appear as though I slept through most of them and only tuned in at the end, but I am particularly compelled by your notion and your charge, really, um, that we do better about uh, bridging the gap of racism that exists on Sunday mornings. Mm. And um, having been transformed in my own ministry by the sort of uh, chapel experiences that we had here under our former dean and former director of music where we struggle daily and, and do our very best to be ecumenical and embrace a wide variety of traditions and experiences, um, fail, but, but try our best, be very faithful in that. I'm wondering what it is you imagine that sort of worship experience looks like. How might we begin to bridge those gaps or do some of the deconstruction necessary in order to worship together while being respectful of a variety of theological perspectives and, and um, cultural perspectives and any other sort of hermeneutic experiences? Yes. Yeah, that's a big question and, and that's one of the things that makes it difficult for um, such, a, such a vision of the future to happen in the midst of the present. One thing Nora and I did in, um, uh, was to work on a book on um, multicultural worship, and we were trying to do uh, um, to ask those very questions. Uh, the um, the piece that I wrote in that book was called the Apocalypse of Worship, uh, the Revelation of Worship, and what it looks like. And I tried to look at um, Mark's presentation and how it gave us some clues as to how we could begin that process. A lot of it begins with. Um, with uh, dynamics of inner relationship in terms of power dynamics, um, trust dynamics, um, being able to overcome uh, bridges of separation in terms of distance, and um, I don't mean just vast distance, but distance within the same communities. I mean, churches are beginning that. I mean, they're working together um, to try to um, build bridges in terms of worship and, and mission and opportunities. Um, how we um, continue to move in that direction, um, I think, uh, uh, I don't have answers for it. Um, what I see, though, is that what we do now can't reflect what we're looking for in the future and how we can move through the trust issues and power issues and dynamics to create more of that worship opportunity in the present the closer we get to that future reality. And I think sometimes that has to happen in special worship um, opportunities. It has to happen in larger gatherings where people come together. Um, it has to happen where um, some communities take risks. But it's not just a thing that a, that a minister or an educator does. It has to be something that congregations themselves are committed to. So it begins with teaching inside a congregation before you can necessarily go outside the congregation. I and mean, we have you know, churches of, um, uh, I, I've served on presbytery committees, Presbyterian, trying to um, bring churches together that were of the same ethnicity, who were small churches, and they don't want to come together. And you know, it's not a matter of, of uh, breaching an ethnicity boundary. It's, you know, my church is here, my church is here, and we want to keep the same church. So there are all these dynamics to work through. Still, I think there is um, a pull from the future that demands we continue to work. Figuring out, doing the hard work of figuring it out and struggling um, and, and meeting the inevitable conflict that occurs as a result of that struggling, I think, is what, what I'm pushing for here. I don't have, a, have an answer, but I think we are called uh, to struggle in that direction if that's what we see. So, and, and you know, that was a confined example. I'd, I'd expand that to when we talk about economic injustice or social injustice. Um, those are some broader areas where we also need to envision what the future looks like with God and see where that future is different from the present. And then that calls us to do something. The gentleman behind the bell. I want to thank you very much, first of all, for everything that you said. I like to see somebody tackle questions like this uh, figuratively, in dead earnest. Um, That's I, nice. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are two things uh, somewhat uh, unrelated that I wanted to uh, ask you. During your first talk, I was struck for some reason or other by 
phrases here and there that reminded me of uh, René Girard's um, Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World. I don't know whether you know anything about his work or not, but he's a Roman Catholic uh, anthropologist and theologian. Uh, and uh, he begins also with uh, matters having to do with death. He asks himself the question, how is it that the world over, uh, we can't talk about the starting of a city mm. without talking about sacrifice, mm. without talking about deliberate and planned death. That's one thing I wanted to ask, whether you had seen that book. The second thing is not related, but uh, it's dear to my heart as a uh, graduate of this place and also the University of Chicago Divinity School and English Department. How do you relate in your mind imagination and revelation? Ah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, how I relate imagination and revelation. Uh, what I tried to do in particular that first lecture and then what has kind of directed me for all three of these lectures, I think um, uh, the imagination is one of the places where God's spirit can touch us and move us in a dramatic and potent way because we let our guards down there. And I think, you know, some of that, it's, you know, that, 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 that speaking uh, with uh, John that he talks about when he's um, taken up to the heavenly realm, I think imagination plays a role in his ability to hear and see what he's able to hear and see. What I've been trying to do is to um, do something similar, that is imagine beyond um, the normal um, constructs that I work with and try to pull from some popular culture constructs, imaginative constructs that um, I must admit made me a little bit anxious about um, doing these lectures because I didn't know how it was going to work and whether or not you were going to be imaginative with me um, because you could re immediately reject a popular culture metaphor, particularly one like Living Dead, and everything then falls. The, it, the lectures won't work unless you can imagine with me. And I use one quote once I, I, um, um, in that first lecture, uh, and I can't remember um, uh, uh, whose book it comes from now, um, but it was, it was one of the uh, um, preaching texts that I had worked from. It's talking about the, we, we allow that to happen in many key ways, like for example, the broken loaf. Without the imagination, it's hard for us to key in um, and understand what that symbol fully, truly means as Jesus represents it to us. If you're going to say, well, it's a loaf of bread, Jesus, that's where it begins and that's where it ends, then you can't go with him into the, the broader theological message he wants to present. So I think it's not just the imagination of the speaker. The community has to be willing to imagine with him or her. And we do that all the time, as that text said, when we go to a movie or we read a novel. We'll suspend um, and we'll imagine. We often don't do that in more critical areas of our lives because we feel like we need to be literal, we need to be serious, et cetera. But imagination can open us up to serious possibilities that are beyond our imagination if we allow it to happen. So, that's, so I've been trying to imagine as I've worked through this. We'll take one final question because we do need to end. Okay. I wondered if you would speak to the hopes that we pin on death in, in our political life, in popular culture, and, uh, and how uh, one deals with that. And I'll give an example. Just the, the fact that Osama bin Laden is killed, and I think we think he's dead dead. But well, that's right. I think we do think he's dead, dead, and, he's, and it's not dead, dead. It's type it's, A, dead. Maybe exactly. Right. Yeah. And and the living dead still remains in terms of being able to carry out the ideas and movements. But yet, we tend to, as when I say we, I mean the country and the culture. And there's a lot of cheering at the death of certain perceived enemies, as if it's going to kill what it is that we think is evil. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, one of the things um, that I've been uh, trying to push throughout all these lectures is that we move away from individual focus, focus on individual people and individual misdeeds, and look at cosmic. 
realities because I think that's where apocalyptic language is calling us and to see how we're all caught up in that cosmic um, um, a malformed reality. And so all of us are misshapen. Some of us are misshapen more than others, but we're all drawn into it. We're all infected by um, well, what Paul calls sin and death, what I was calling this, this phenomenon of living death. So if we can see more on a cosmic level rather than an individual level, I think we can begin to see beyond individual people doing individual bad things, even though that's something we need to attend to. But what's incredibly important that we often miss are the symbols that are, or the systems that are put in place because of this kind of cosmic condition that these authors are talking about. The, and the other thing, um, um, uh, since this probably will be my last word, I wanted to, to note um, that I'm continually thinking about the gentleman who asked the question here that then connects with the question you're asking about how we pin things on death. Um, that's what has been driving um, these lectures for me. I started with a question and have been struggling with a question since I've been doing much of my research um, and teaching. Um, I come out of an, well, I come out of an African American tradition and I've been reading these slave narratives and these, um, these slave materials and um, looking at the way suffering and death is imposed and then made um, to seem um, by the people who impose it um, a liberating reality, that it does something for them as a people, that um, their suffering and sacrifice does something. And I've seen that happen within um, um, present and contemporary lives as well. That's what I'm working against. I'm trying to figure that out. I don't, I don't think God has slaves suffer in order that um, a society can move forward. No matter how much the society earned economically from the work of slaves, I don't think that sacrifice is what was intended in a beneficial way. We made it beneficial by the way the country used that labor to um, develop its infrastructure and its wealth early on. But I don't think that's how God is operating. I think God is operating to try to help us move beyond that. And I think the cross, I'm trying to figure out how the cross plays in that. And I'm trying to figure out how we understand death and how it's playing and all of that. And I recognize that that's a key, um, crucial moment for us. And for me, um, I mean, I, I will admit, I preach the cross much more than I preach re resurrection um, because it's so vital for me. But I'm also struggling with what's God doing? And how do I look at what, what God is doing? And that's why it seems to me the resurrection becomes the one singular thing that we know for sure nobody but God can do. And if we take that as our starting point, then we can look at everything else. We can look at Jesus' ministry. We can look at his death. We can look at how we live in response to disciples. And that's how we stop pinning things on death, but we pin it on life. We pin it on the future life that God promises to each of us. But we've got to believe, unlike Boltmann, that the thing happened and that it will happen in the future. It's not collapsing everything into the future. It's just simply saying that there is a future reality we can depend on, and that future changes, transforms our present. I'm wondering, does it even transform the way we look at something as dear and as valuable as the cross? And so that's what's propelled me into to these lectures. We thank you immensely for your lecture. Thank you.